Okay, so I'm going to talk about interplanetary consensus and scaling blockchains with subnets in a simple, easy to trust. I can't believe I wrote this uh, title. It's not a good title. Let's make it IPC made simple. This is what we're going to talk about. Uh, so first of all, Marco said that we want to actually scale blockchains and consensus is the bottleneck. And scaling means that we can do vertical scaling or horizontal scaling, and we're doing both. So vertical scaling in our case means thinking about uh, new core protocols that would be more efficient or that will have faster confirmation times. And um, putting this uh, starfish there just as a teaser. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And of course, what everybody typically wants is horizontal scaling. And horizontal scaling, there are typically, we call it, it's called a layer two solution. So there are several approaches that currently run in the market. So we have uh, sharding. And sharding is well established. It's an old technique that is used for a lot of time, but it fits very well for kind of old generation applications where the application and all the infrastructure belonged to a single company, a single organization, because it is very complex and it is hard to maintain. And if you democratize your, your resources, it might be a problem. This is why it is still very good and distributed databases, there are companies that specialize in that. Uh, can also be used in blockchains, would not solve everything, of course, nothing will. There are zero knowledge proofs. That is very promising and there are already applications that, that work in several places. Again, it has its pros and cons, but you can compose it on other solutions as well. Also, when you do zero knowledge, zero knowledge uh, proofs and use it, then the execution still has to somehow happen. Not everybody needs to do it, but still you have to somehow serialize it. So it is good, promising, but not the only way. And then we have payment channels. That's another option. Many of you might know Lightning Network. So in terms of scalability, this is amazing. It's very distributed. You can scale to really huge uh, throughputs very fast. And the idea is that you just do everything off-chain. And then at the end, you settle it on the chain. But it has a limited functionality. It is payment channels, and it does payment. And you cannot do everything. Very good, of course. Not. And then there's another. There's another approach that is using side chains, like Marco mentioned. It's just spawning new uh, particular blockchains that are, that are specific for, for some task. Now, that is also very interesting. And well, now is the question, how do you use those side chains? So we, IPC actually goes to that approach. And I'll just tell him briefly, what does it mean? You have those different, uh, oh, I have a pointer, but cannot see. So there is the root chain, that's the main chain. And then you can just spawn an seemingly independent chain that sometimes checkpoint for security to the parent. And the child chain, the, what we call a subnet, can spawn its own, and so on and so on. It cannot go indefinitely, because someone has to do all the computations, but can go enough and it can do, go very wide, so clearly horizontal scaling. And the question is, how do you structure all those sidechains? So here, what in IPC we are doing is we're structuring it in a tree topology. So that is one way. You can think about it that this entire sidechain approach, in, in some sense, it, it is between sharding and payment channels in the terms of the trade-offs that, that you can get. Because sharding is, uh, I mean, you can do everything on sharding, right? But uh, it's complicated and it has high costs. And here you can see that there is something similar to sharding, right? The smaller chains, they, they keep only a part of the state. So you do divide the state a little bit in a divide and conquer manner. But it's not exactly sharding, because there is duplication. You do checkpointing, and you do other stuff. And 
and chains are not exactly the same, like shards are the same, so it's not exactly sharding. And then there is payment chains. You can think of it, I tell you, these side chains and this approach as extending payment channels in the way that there is more uh, functionality here. You're taking some of the load off the main chain, doing a lot of stuff in the, in the subnet. And then you checkpoint, just like uh, payment channels settle, settle the channel on the main chain. So it's extending it in some way. It doesn't mean it's better than either of them. It just gives you different trade-offs that you can play with. And having different trade-offs to play with is very important. This is why we are not the only ones that are going in this approach. This approach is interesting for other companies. Many of you might know Polkadot or Cosmos or Polygon. Polygon is a plasma implementation that's for Ethereum. And each of them chooses some different kind of uh, trade-off. For example, in, Polka, in Polkadot, the way that they organize those side chains, they have this, uh, can call it one ring to rule them all. So <laughs> there is one uh, net that is the, controls everybody and everybody is connected to it. And Cosmos is actually much more general. It's like arbitrary connections between the, the subnets. And uh, Polygon, which is a plasma implementation, actually gives you also a tree structure, but it adds a very nice touch to its uh, checkpointing mechanism that is more secure in some sense, but it limits the functionality. So you can only have a functionality of payment and not general. And then we have IPC, which offers different trade-offs. And let's see like an example, what, what do we mean with uh, IPC? So we have here subnets, there is the world subnet and it, uh, the world is the mainnet, the root net, and then you can have uh, two subnets, Europe and the US, and Europe has its own three subnets and you can see. But besides subnets, there are also users, right? So we have here the cat in the hat and the lorex, thing one, thing two, the Grinch, right? You can add whatever Dr. Seuss characters you want as users. I'm fine with it. And then we also have another user, that's Marco. Marco is also using. And Marco has uh, an account in Serbia and an account in Zurich. Now, a very nice thing that I want to touch here, and this is th what this slide is talking about, is that in those uh, topologies, what happens is usually and IPC and the other implementations, that a single account can interact anywhere in the system. For example, Marco now wants to pay the Grinch. And Marco in Zurich can pay the Grinch in Omaha, even though they're not in the same subnet and it's completely different. So that is very, that is very powerful, right? What, in, what do we have here? We have a flexible subnet structure. We said before, every subnet can run its own consensus protocol. Doesn't even have to be a consensus. It can be just a maybe causal order broadcast or whatever we want. So it's very free to have whatever trade-offs they want. It can be very fast. It can be more secure, less secure. And on top of it, you can interact anywhere in this hierarchy with a single account. This is really, that, that is so much that I imagine it as a thingamajigger, meaning it's a motorcycle, airplane, submarine. It can do a lot. But I claim that actually doing so much is more of a problem than a feature. And let me explain you why. Actually, how does Marco pay the Grinch in Omaha. So what actually happens is that Marco gives one file coin to the Zurich subnet, and, and then the Zurich subnet gives this, uh, sends this file coin to Switzerland, and Switzerland sends it to Europe, and it goes like that throughout the subnet until it reaches the Omaha subnet, and the Omaha subnet gives this file coin to the Grinch. 
Now, in this, in this architecture, the money changes a lot of hands. And who are those hands? Most of them, we don't know them. Right? The, who owns the money when it's in transfer? It's the Switzerland subnet, it's the Europe subnet. It, it's not us. Who's in charge of the money? And who's paying the fees? So Marco needs to pay, let's say Marco is paying the fees. He needs to pay the fees for all those subnets on the way. But he only, he sends, he sends it from Tzu. He doesn't uh, play anywhere else. So he decides on all the fees already before and what happens if, if something fails. So when you start thinking about it like that, not saying, oh, it's okay, it can get there. It's an, from a mechanism design perspective, it's just a nightmare trying to facilitate something like that. And this is why we're proposing something a bit different and actually not having the power for, for any account to interact with the entire network. Because we think having less power will actually be, be better in the sense that less is more, right, for people that are using uh, Unix stuff. Uh, the way we do it is that we focus on users. Before that, it was very focused on the subnets. Right? And if you look back here, it goes to the Zurich subnet and the Zurich now. It's very custodial. Each time there is a subnet that is in charge of the money and, and we have to go through that. And we want it to be less custodial and focus on the users, which means that we think of a user not as an account, but a user can have multiple accounts in different subnets. So we can think that each user has a hierarchy of accounts, like a, has multiple accounts, and then we will restrict the possible interactions. If before any account in any subnet could, it, could interact with any other account in any other subnet, now we're gonna restrict the interactions that are going to be only, like different users can interact only within the one subnet, if where they ha both have accounts, and cross subnet interactions are gonna be only inside the same user. So we're doing less, it's more restricted, but it will make our life better. And when it's an infrastructure thing, it's, uh, don't wanna look at it, but how would it look, this overlay of uh, user account infrastructure, uh, hierarchy? So we see here that Marco in the mainnet, he has his account, and in this account, there are allocated funds to both accounts in like sub-accounts, one in uh, Europe, one in the US. And in the Europe, there are allocated funds to three sub-accounts, and so on and so on. So that's now the uh, user account hierarchy. Right? Each user has this hierarchy. And let's look what happens now in the same example as before. So, so now Marco has multiple accounts and having multiple accounts for a user, it's not a problem. You press a button, you open an account. It's not, not an issue. Now again, Marco wants to send one file coin to the Grinch. So the simple option would be just, okay, Marco in the US send one file coin to the Grinch in the US and we don't care, but let's say for the sake of example that Marco wants actually to move the Falcon from its Zurich account and the Grinch wants it in the Omaha account. So what will happen now? Now we restricted the interactions. So Marco in Zurich sends the Falcon to Marco in Switzerland. Marco in Switzerland sends it to Marco in Europe and so on until it reaches Marco in the US, so it's all within the same user. Then inside the US subnet, the file coin is transferred to the Grinch and the Grinch propagates it through its own user accounts down. And now what do we get? We get that, we will get that it is very clear where is the money, right? First of all, we can pay it because we are uh, at at each subnet we have an account and we can pay and we can pay and if for some reason it fails in the middle, we know where it is. 
it's not uh, that we send our ship from uh, from Australia to Chile in the and some well the chi the ship didn't make it it sunk somewhere in the Pacific. The ship is always next to us. We know where it sunk. We can get the stuff out of it. And so it makes stuff uh, much much simpler. Any questions about that before I'm going to summary? No? Yeah, that's kind of simple. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, what are the atomicity claims about this? Uh, what is the what? Atomicity claims. Okay. Well, what do you mean in the in this sense? Each subnet? Well, just overall end-to-end, -end, I suppose, right? Or. Over yeah, I mean, in an end-to-end -end sense. Well, you cannot uh, say too much. You can say about each interaction that it's going to happen or not. That is exactly the issue, because let's say that Marco wants to move the, the Falcon from Zurich to the Grinch in Omaha. You cannot guarantee in the beginning that it's going to succeed, because we cannot predict the future. Maybe. Maybe now, in, when he will reach the main net in the world, he will not have enough funds to, to pay the fees because the fees just rose. So that is something that you cannot, you cannot say if you want each subnet to be independent in some way. You cannot guarantee more than that. Right. Did that answer your question? What about gas fees? So gas fees are determined by each subnet itself. Right? I cannot control when someone spawns a subnet, I cannot control what would be the gas fees in, in this subnet. So this is why it's also important that Marco, if he has to pay the fees, that he will have an account there. So he will have to pay the fees from this account. And I'm assuming from Zurich to the U.S. is paid by Marco, and from the U.S. to Omaha is paid by the Grinch? Could be, you know, but yeah. But the Grinch can, for example, ask Marco to give him some more money for that, but that is already user-defined. Yeah. Uh, another question, then we'll, we'll go, and then other questions afterwards, because I want to be on time. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Really insightful. Um, I wanted to ask, so what uh, would be the disadvantage of just having the transaction, one transaction happening at the world chain? Uh, because in any case, every node needs to be checked in the world, right? And if it, that happens at the world level, everybody could like sort of update their state, right? On the China. So some things you want to do in the, in the world, right? But sometimes there are dedicated chains, dedicated blockchains for a specific use, and you want to have your funds there. Oh, no, no, I get that. I mean, when there's a transaction of this type, since you are going already through the world, from okay. one, like, one branch to the other branch through the world anyways, you're going to have to pay fees there anyways. And everybody is still a full node, or at least checking the node chain, the, the world chain. Why don't you just like transact everybody at the world level and forget about uh, passing through every single step of the way? Definitely, I would say, this is what I said, the first option would be not even going on the world. Marco pays the Grinch directly in the US because it's cheaper there, right? It's a smaller subnet, it's cheaper. But uh, we wanted to see what happens if he wants to move because that is what he wants. He doesn't have enough funds there, I don't know. He wants to move his funds from, from Zurich to Omaha. This is the... Question. Okay, I'll take other questions afterwards. Just to summarize, so we'll be more or less on time. We propose to connect the side chains in a tree structured topology such that any, any sub, subnet would be completely independent and can run its own consensus protocol, so it's very uh, flexible in that sense. And on top of that, we, uh, we propose to improve it by adding a uh, restriction on, on what interactions can happen between accounts. 
and doing that by also having a tree-based uh, tree topology of uh, user accounts. And by doing that, we can have non-custodial accounting, and we can have a much simpler and more robust design. And this is extremely important because we are talking here on IPC, it is an infrastructure. It is not a... It is not an application for the user. It's an infrastructure that things should be built on top. So it should be simple and robust and easy to maintain. And that is how we think, or, and that is how we propose to do it. And when you think about it like that, as an infrastructure, it would be kind of lean. Yeah, it is more restricted, definitely. But in the same sense, you can think of uh, like, uh, Unix, uh, Linux uh, in comparison to Windows, right? It's a more restricted set of operations, but it's more robust. And on top of that, we can build applications. For example, Marco transferring his funds from uh, Zurich to the US, that could be a user-friendly application that would do everything for him, so he will not have to do each one of it by itself. Or we can have uh, an application on top of this infrastructure that would take care of uh, atomic, atomic uh, swaps. Between, between different stuff, uh, different uh, chains. And we can build on top of that uh, a shortcut service, also as an application. Let's say we want to have a shortcut from Zurich directly to Omaha. Then we can have a smart contract that uh, of an application that would just provide you this shortcut. So there are a lot of things that can be built on, to on top of this infrastructure if we build it correctly. And this is why I think it's very important to have it uh, as simple as possible. In another way that I think about it, we can take the <laughs> motorcycle airplane submarine, and instead of that, I propose we should build a tractor as an infrastructure, and then we can simply add the airplane and the submarine on top of it. <laughs> All right? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, okay. And that, uh, that was it. So if the... Yeah. All right, thank you, Guy. In typical Guy fashion, he decides to front run me and start taking questions. Before we explain the process, since we are streaming and recording, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be delivered to you before asking the question. We do have time for a couple of questions now. Alfonso will be talking about the implementation details of all of this. So if your question is about implementation, you, might have to, you may want to wait another 20 minutes. But if you have questions right now, please go ahead. Can you explain how many atomic steps are involved in, into a transfer of value from one subnet to the other? How many what? Atomic steps. Every, does everything oh. happen in a single atomic steps, or is it broken down in multiple ones, one for each subnet? It's uh, one for each subnet. So uh, I'm actually going to repeat the question that was asked earlier, because I, I didn't really get the explanation. Why can't you just use the least lowest common ancestor to synchronize uh, what one, so instead of going through all of the ancestors and then all of the sins, why can't you just use the lowest common ancestor to transfer a value from one subnet to the I other? I think that is the best thing. That would be the best thing, and that is what I said. So that would be the well, option one, right? Exactly, that would be the best. But sometimes I don't know why you don't want to do it. I'm, not, uh, I'm saying, yeah, that probably would be 90% of the time. I agree, completely. All right, one more question there. Thank you for the talk. I like that. I, I'm expanding on those questions, those two. Uh, so if we take Cosmos up as an example, they what? are do Which the one? Cosmos. Cosmos, okay. Yeah, they, they are doing the settlement in it, their main app, and it's fine, right? So they have all the side chains, uh, more or less sidechains, but they have all the chains and they have their own transactions, but the settlement is always done in, in the app. What is the benefit of having a model like that instead of uh, a central world app that does all the, the settlement? Because we wanted to be more, uh, in that sense, generic and not dependent on a single 
single kind of, uh, like I said, a single ring to rule them all. Right? So actually, this, uh, let's go, Europe can operate actually even without the world in some sense. And it can have its own, its own subnets and everything. And we don't want to rely on, on the world being very, very special and have special properties. Actually, you can look at each one of those subtrees as completely independent. Yeah, but and in, uh, in Cosmos, they don't have it. They, they, they actually, even each chain uh, that's under the main hub can be an app. And we can cut that main app, and that is the new yeah. center of the world in Center in of the view. world, but it's not the one that is uh, relating. Now, it is very similar, because like I said, those approaches, sorry, here, they, they have a lot of similarities, more similarities than uh, differences, because it's a really good idea. We, we also think that. I I'm was just trying to check what is the uh, the main difference we, we are all get it, but what is the benefit that uh, we got in that model instead of the other ones that already already exist? So what I what I think and what we say is that the simplicity in this uh, in this model having having it restricted and not so much uh, uh, custodial that you have to trust so many so many steps on the way because each step by itself is atomic you cannot guarantee what will happen throughout and what will happen if it fails and how you design the incentive mechanism for that this is the main uh, benefit from this simpler design Thank you.